Okay, so today's lecture is going to be on um, the concept of fluctuating or recurring impairments. What we're going to be talking about today is a, a fairly kind of contentious topic um, based in, in current models of, of understanding of, of disability and the lived experience of having an impairment. So we're going to start off um, by, by talking about different modes of understanding disability. Obviously, there are a, a variety that are prevalent in society today. Um, then I'm going to introduce you to some of the, the limited literature that exists in this area, uh, predominantly research that's been carried out in Canada, quite interestingly, um, looking at these ideas from the research and literature about um, being not disabled enough, um, for example, and also this idea of having a disability sometimes, so the, the, the idea that something might fluctuate. Also, we'll just spend a bit of time looking at um, the role of terminology in understanding disability and um, the lived experience of disability, as well as drawing on some work that's been done by Michelle Foucault surrounding uh, the, the importance of discourse in, in supporting understanding of, of different societal phenomena. And then I'm going to, to bring the discussion to a close by looking at some student views in this context and, and what it means to be a student who has a, a fluctuating or recurring period. So the two dominant but ways of understanding and disability, some of the main arguments about the lived experience of disability, could be categorised into being medical or, or social. In the 1960s, um, people who had a variety of disabilities had limited access to the decision making process in terms of, for example, policy, provision, um, and certainly discourse and, and policy and legislation were dominated by a largely medicalised etiological approach. But that started to change from the, the mid 70s onwards and, and into the 80s when the work of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation, or the UPIAS for short, um, became a, a, very, um, a very important and very uh, influential group, and really because that was one of the first times that the, the concept of interpretation uh, was applied to disability studies, and, and people uh, who had impairments their set themselves became very prolific advocates and researchers in the field. Amongst them um, were luminaries such as Vic Finkelstein, Mike Oliver, and Mike Oliver is one of the names who's most associated with the so-called social model of disability, and what he called a reaction to the, the personal tragedy theory that had until such times and dominated a lot of discourse and, and a lot of assumptions about living with a disability. So the social model um, acknowledges that actually society has a big role in the lived experience of disability, and it's actually that society imposes those limitations on people who have an impairment rather than it being anything to do with the, the shortcoming of the individual um, and the, the, the physical or mental symptoms which they, which they have. But interestingly, in both these different ways of looking at disability, um, the, the construct itself is assumed to be unchanging, to be something that's, that's constant, and I think that's, that's an area that needs to be opened up for discussion. Because it re in reality, a lot of impairments do have a, a massive tendency to, to vary. So, for example, chronic fatigue syndrome um, or, or ME, epilepsy or diabetes, someone who has an impairment on, on one of those spectrums, um, it, it's obviously going to change in, in how it manifests itself. It's not always going to be the same every day or, or at any point in one given day, for example. And although a lot of these impairments are now formally recognised um, and are, are, are diagnosed again under the, the medical model, there is, to some extent, um, a limited acceptance um, and, and quite a lot of contra controversy around that, that acceptance. And within the research, it's a, it's a fairly uh, um, un under-researched area, but a, a strand of research that runs very closely in parallel is, is that of this idea of chronic illness. Michael Burry has written extremely prolifically and um, very extensively on the impact of living with chronic, uh, chronic illness um, and how that can cause some biographical disruption. So someone who has a chronic illness is going to experience that in a very varied way over their life course to, with, with varying intensity. And as I mentioned, there's a very prolific uh, research community in Canada at the moment. Um, Sherry L. Peters talks about this idea of having a disability sometimes, so something that is, is not always permanent in, in someone's life experiences. There's also increasingly a lot of advocacy work and, and also research and, and legislation um, coming from, from Canada. For example, the Episodic Disabilities Framework has been developed to, book, to model um, how, how people with uh, impairments that vary over time experience those impairments and, and how they might impact on their wellness and daily activities. The Episodic Disabilities Employment Network is a very well-established group as is the Episodic Disabilities Network as well, again in Canada, as well as the Canadian Working Group on HIV and Rehabilitation. And in terms of the, the, the research aspect, um, Eileen McKee has done a lot of work and looking at episodic disabilities in the specific context of the workplace and the Canadian Arthritis Patients Alliance. Um, 
Ernie Lightman and Andrea Vick at the University of Toronto look at um, the eligibility for how long-term long -term assistance based on the questionable legitimacy of shifting medical conditions uh, can be conceptualised and, and um, how that type of support might be accessed. And um, Vickers has looked at various aspects of work and unseen chronic illnesses as well. So as I say, parallels with the, um, Michael Burry's work as well as this idea of the fluctuating intensity of, of disability. So this is a, um, a diagram of uh, the episodic disabilities framework. Um, as you can see, there's a number of aspects to this. Um, the line refers to the lived experience um, with, with um, various episodes either being triggered by external or, or internal factors. And you can see that there's the uh, massive potential for, for fluctuations to occur um, over, the, over the course of someone's life, either on a, a micro scale or, or on a much larger macro scale. Uh, so we argued that there are four different dimensions to um, living with an episodic disability. Firstly, the impact of symptoms on imp of, or impairments and, and how those might affect and affect someone. Then difficulties pragmatically with day-to-day -day activities. And challenges to social inclusion, so different types of perception and how they might affect someone's so, um, participation in society. And then the individual's uncertainty of what it's like to live with a, a very unpredictable um, aspect of, of an identity and how that might change. As I said, terminology is a, a massive part of this as well, and, and, and at this point there's not necessarily any agreed terminology to, to help conceptualise this idea of, of disability or impairments varying over time. And I think part of that is that people are very reticent to want to impose labels. There's so much of that that happens already in disability studies and conceptualising disability that people don't want to engage in, in that sort of, sort of negative, uh, negative categorisation. Interestingly though, um, in various different um, legislation documents and in research, it is something that's, that's becoming uh, much, much more frequently discussed and is part, of, um, part of, of modern discourse. For example, the Equality Act in 2010 does try to make some attempt to add to, uh, to clarify some of the, the definitions that it uses within, within its um, remit. So it talks about, for example, motor neuron disease, mus muscular dystrophy and dementia as being progressive. Uh, chronic fatigue syndrome or ME, depression, ex epilepsy, those are categorised as either fluctuating or recurring. Um, but the main premise really there is that an impairment which um, has lasted or is likely to last at least 12 months constitutes this idea of a long-term condition. So that's, that's the, the overarching concept there. But interestingly, guidance on the, the government website says that there are special rules covering recu recurring or fluctuating conditions, and that's a very contentious area within the literature, this idea of normalisation and what actually constitutes special in the, the context of disability studies. The General Medical Council and the Department of Health um, have both engaged in this debate as well, and are beginning to use terminology like fluctuating conditions or progressive conditions, uh, the Work Life website as well uses the term chronic fluctuating conditions um, and it's been co-developed by a number of interested consortia uh, including the Department of Work and Pensions, the MS Society and it um, houses information on various aspects of the law, benefits and disabled people's rights in, in, in accessing uh, the support that's, that's appropriate for them. I think of noti notable importance for the higher education sector, recently the London School of Economics um, acknowledges or acknowledge the potential impact of having a long-term medical condition on learning and the, the, the sports available for students within the institution. And similarly, London South Bank University actually suggests that it's something that students should consider at the application stage um, in order to, to make sure that they get the, the support and the reasonable adjustments put in place that, that are appropriate for them. As I said, the, the role of discourse and, and shared understanding is extremely important in, in trying to, to add to this, um, this very complex uh, conceptualisation. And the work of Michelle Foucault is extremely important here and, and very useful, I would argue. Foucault has said that knowledge and meaning are essentially produced um, through often competing discourses and organisation of assumptions. And that's very important for the lived experience of, 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 of disability, obviously because he's done a lot of work in, in understanding mental illness and how that's been influenced by existential phenomenology and better understanding of, of the self and, and self practices. Foucault's concept of the technologies of the self is also very interesting and very useful in this context because it, it talks about the different tools that one can um, implement to produce an, a, a bit what he calls a better ethical um, understanding. Incorporating bodies and souls, thoughts, conduct and, and a way of being um, in, in identity construction and better self-awareness.
So there's elements of language and discourse, power and autonomy, and these are all part of identity creation and evolution that obviously for people with fluctuating or recurring impairments does be over the life course. So recent research has been carried out um, in terms of student perceptions as well, because it's it's all very well and good having lots of different um, research and, and shared um, shared terminology, but it's also important to actually talk to people who, who have this this um, a, a fluctuating or recurring impairment as part of their identity. So students raised um, some terminology that was already present in the literature, but also added um, to some, some of their own examples as well. So for example, um, episodic, inconsistent, fluctuating, uh, interestingly they're unpredictable, variable, changeable. So lots of different ways that, um, that, that it could be discussed or, or conceptualised. But a couple of, of emerging uh, issues from that. The students who spoke about episodic as being useful also did some limitations in it as well. They said that it carried a kind of a tone of regularity, like a TV episode, for example, when you can't necessarily predict when uh, an, an episode of wellness, wellness is going to be is going to be long or short, minimal impact or, or whatever. So there's possible negative connotations around that. Similarly, inconsistent, and um, it certainly gets across the idea that there's a fluctuation of variance in wellness. But there's also a bit of hesitation that it might actually attribute some of the control to the individual, which obviously is not the case. A lot of students spoke about um, having a fluctuating or recurring impairment in a very interesting kind of binary uh, way. So, for example, an on and off disability or impairment, um, up and down, come and go, it was very much one or the other, whereas other students spoke about a spectrum of wellness. So, so, so that was quite a, an interesting uh, division here. And all of the students did say that it would be useful to have some sort of shared terminology to, to help try and, and foster some increased legitimacy, but also had difficulty finding and agreeing on something that would be useful because the diversity of impairments within this, this potential category is absolutely huge. Also, they cautioned that um, very often concepts can become quickly outdated based on changes in discourse, changes in policy, practice and research. So it's something that would be useful, but a huge amount of care has to be taken in terms of modelling the, the information that, that would be relevant and would be applicable.